Uh, you mentioned you wrote a book on Area 51. For people who don't know, you've written a lot about security, the military, secrets, all this kind of stuff. So Area 51 is one of the legendary mm -hmm. centers of all of these kinds of topics. So high level first is what is Area 51? As you understand it, as you've written about the lore and the reality. I think everybody wants to know about Area 51 because it kind of, it's like this American enigma, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like to some people, it's the Shangri-La of, uh, you know, test bed aerospace programs, right? And to others, it's the place of captured aliens, right? And everything in between. I had the great fortune of interviewing 75 people who lived and worked at that base for extended periods of time. Uh, mostly leading up to the 90s because everything since then is classified, right? So things get declassified after decades, not everything, but some, and that allows you to piece together stories. So you talked to a lot of people that work there. Um, what can you describe as the sort of the history of technological development that went on there? I mean, Area 51 is huge, by the way, and it's, you know, it's a secret, it's a top secret military facility inside a top secret military facility, inside the Nevada Test and Training Range, which is this massive, not secret facility, right? So you're just talking about layers, talk about peeling the onion in reverse. And it began as a place to test the U-2 spy plane. Um, and literally the CIA set up shop there to build this plane away from the public eye. And then that led to another uh, espionage platform called the A-12 Oxcart, which is, you know, anyone who's seen the X-Men movies knows about the SR-71. But bef And that's a two-seater, right? And before that, that, there was the A-12 Oxcart. And that was the CIA's stealth Mach 3 spy plane. You know, think about that in the early 1960s. It's astonishing. Uh, and I interviewed the pilots who flew it. Um, what do they say about it? What, oh what my it like? God. I mean, you know, look, I, I describe in detail mm -hmm. in Area 51, but also the, the amazing thing, Lex, about that was that, and, you know, I just look back on that with such fondness. This is like in 2009 when I was reporting that. And all, many of the guys who were in their 80s and 90s were World War II heroes, like serious World War II heroes, like Colonel Slater, who was the commander of Area 51. He flew the U-2 on the, what, the missions called the Black Cat missions over China in the early 1960s to see about their Lopnor nuclear facility, right? So all of these things tie in when you're reporting on military um, and intelligence programs. But that these guys had been World War II heroes and then were given this cushy job out at Area 51, you know? And it just came with all these perks. Colonel Slater told me this one perk I just love so much. They all had a hankering for lobster one day, right? And here they are in the middle of the desert in Nevada. And they have these really fast planes, <laughs> you know? And they literally called, like they arranged, they didn't take the, the ox guard out for that one, but they... They they would they got some lobsters from Massachusetts like delivered to them in like record time. They didn't even need to put them <laughs> on ice, you know. And again, those are the these details where you're like, thank God, at least for me, thank God I got these details. These guys are all yeah. past now. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of incredible technological work going on there. So the legend, the lore, like you said, mm -hmm. aliens. Mm -hmm. Were there ever aliens in Area 51, as you understand it? So I've interviewed hundreds of people. That worked there. In the net, well, not just at Area 51, but in all the different national security and military intelligence and intelligence programs. And I have, I personally have no reason to believe that aliens have ever visited Earth. That's just me personally. Visited Earth, period. I, I, I have no information to, that, that causes me to conclude that's the case. Now, with that said, Many of the primary players in this present day, you know, there are aliens among us narrative are in my phenomena book. Mm -hmm. I continue to communicate with a lot of these people. I'm talking about astrophysicists mm -hmm. um, who fundamentally believe that there are aliens among us, right? 
Um, so we beg to differ on that issue. But for you, in terms of doing research on uh, government agencies that do top secret military work, I mean, they would know, right? So you have interviewed a lot of people that have, at, at every layer of the onion, you don't have a, you don't, you don't see evidence or um, a reason to believe that there was ever aliens or UFOs captured from out of this world. That is correct, and and even perhaps more important, and perhaps this colors my thinking. But I am uniquely familiar with disinformation programs mm. put forth by the CIA or the agency, as it's called, by insiders, right? And I've known and I've learned firsthand about these programs, or rather learned from firsthand participants in strategic deception campaigns that the CIA has engaged in, beginning with Area 51. You know, the idea that all these reports of this U-2 spy plane, this giant, long wind, long winged aircraft flying 70,000 feet up. People didn't think airplanes could fly that high. And it's, you know, the sun shining off of it. It looked like a UFO and all the reports coming in. And the CIA opened up a, a UFO disinformation campaign office mm -hmm. headed by a guy named Toto Autorenko you know, specifically for this reason. Now, does that mean that every UFO sighting in the world is has been a U-2? No. But I come from it from that lane of thinking. And there are so many strategic deception campaigns. And as I look over the decades of how these same UFO stories, and again, this is just my opinion based on my reporting, this narrative that keeps reoccurring, it seems to me like a very large catch-all to keep the public's attention on that, not on that. So, so to you, like sexy stories like UFOs are going to be leveraged by the CIA for strategic deception. A hundred percent. I mean, Google Paul Benowitz. I'm always amazed that Paul Benowitz's story is not more widely spoken of. Um, and I think that's because people, there's like the sort of ufologists or the people who are like absolutely convinced that that aliens are among us. Um, and I use that term loosely, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And then there's the quote unquote skeptics. And the skeptics tend to be sort of like self-righteous. And I would never want to be self-righteous. So I'm not a skeptic. I'm just, you know, agnostic, I suppose. But Google Paul Benowitz, and you can learn the story of that man who thought he saw a UFO in the 70s, early 80s, and the Air Force, because the Air Force intelligence community works hand in glove with CIA a lot, mm -hmm. and some of the other intelligence agencies, of course, they're 17, not just the CIA. And um, they destroyed Paul Benowitz. They sent him to a mental institution by pulling a massive strategic deception campaign against him because they didn't want him to know about the technology that he was seeing at Kirkland Air Force Base. So look that up, and then you go, oh my God. And you know, to my eye, you can apply any of these other names, substitute in Paul Benowitz, or any of the current individuals, you know, who really become convinced of X, Y, or Z, when in fact there's a strategic deception campaign going on. Yeah, there's a, a lot of incentive for the CIA and other intelligence agencies to get you to look the other way on whatever well, whatever is happening. Plus, from a uh, enemy perspective, whenever two nations are at war, to try to create hysteria in the other. But then you have the Thomas theorem that becomes applicable there too. If men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences, right? So this idea of like UFOs and we're being lied to, it becomes real to many people. And then that creates a whole subset of problems to the point where things are spiraling out of control. And there is no there is no center anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people that are briefed on programs maybe don't even aren't even aware of their position within a greater campaign. Or I'm wrong and there are aliens among us.
Right. So, you know, you, I, I appreciate your, the possibility of uh, acknowledging that you might be wrong. Uh, from everything you know about the U.S. government, if there was an alien spacecraft, like, what do you think would happen? Would they be able to hold on to those secrets for, you know, decades? Uh, like, would they want to hold on to those secrets? Like, what would they do? What's your sense? I, I can't imagine that kind of exciting situation not becoming public information, mm -hmm. right? And the counter to that is this, right? Which is, this is a very strong argument for why this is a big strategic deception campaign, mm -hmm. right? Think about the Defense Department and the Air, think about how jealously they guard its airspace, right? I mean, you had a Chinese balloon flying over and the whole world went crazy, right? It was front page news. So the fact that the one element or a couple people in the Defense Department have made this statement, we've lost control of our airspace over this, this UFO, uh, alleged UFO craft that they can't explain. I don't buy that at all. But Zero. Of course, it's possible that, you know, it is alien spacecraft, if it is that, and they operate under a very different set of technological capabilities, in mm -hmm. theory. In my interviews with Jacques Vallée, who is the kind of grandfather of all ufology, and mm -hmm. he's such an interesting person and has such a really unique origin story about how he came into all of this, and he's such a scientist, right? And he is profoundly dedicated to this issue and stands completely on the opposite end of the spectrum from me and knows a lot more and has studied this for decades more. But what he said to me is the most interesting thing, which is that it's not a military problem, it's an intelligence problem. Because Jacques believes that this is some kind of intelligence, right? Which really, the closest I can do to wrapping my head around that takes me to consciousness, right? The idea of what is consciousness. And I think that's where it becomes very interesting. I think the government is hiding bodies and crafts is is very Paul Benowitz. Read it. Google it. <laughs> yeah. Do it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think this kind of flying saucer thing is, uh, is a, a trivialization of what kind of, if there's alien civilizations out there. Trivialization. That's a great word. <laughs> trivialization. That's, I agree with you. I tend to believe that there is, like a very large number of alien civilizations out there. And I I believe we we would have trouble comprehending what that even looks like hmm. were they to visit. I, I tend to believe they are already here or have visited mm -hmm. and we're too dumb to understand what that even means. Mm -hmm. And they certainly would not appear as, um, <laughs> as uh, flying objects that defy gravity for brief moments of time on a low resolution video. Um, I tend to have humility about this, all this kind of stuff, uh, but I think radical humility is required to even like open your eyes to what an alien intelligence would actually mm -hmm. look like. And it, I, to me, it's beyond military applications. It's like the basic human question of like, what is even this thing? Like you mentioned consciousness that's mm -hmm. going on. Like, where does this come from? Mm -hmm. Why is it so powerful? Is it unique in the universe? I tend to believe not. Uh, of course, I, I hang out a bunch with, with other folks like Elon who believe we are alone. But I think that belief, just like you said, has power because it actually manifests itself in, uh, in reality. So if you believe that we're alone in this universe, that's a great motivator to build rockets and become multiplanetary and save ourselves, especially in the case of nuclear war. Uh, because otherwise, whatever this special sauce, this this yeah. flame of consciousness will go out if we destroy ourselves on this earth. And uh, for people like Elon, it's too high of a probability that we destroy ourselves on earth, mm -hmm. not to try to become multiplanetary. 